Hello, this is Martin George, Education Correspondent at the Eastern Daily Press and the Norwich Evening News. I'm with Alex Hayes, the Principal of the University Technical College Norfolk, the first UTC in Norfolk, and today is the opening day of the UTC. Um, thank you for inviting me down here, Alex. No problems. Um, for people who perhaps um, haven't heard much about this before, could you just explain what a UTC is, please? Yeah, basically UTCs uh, were created to fill the skills gap. Um, and in Britain, for a long time, industry has spoken about not having the right qualified people, not having the right school, um, skilled people. So over the last few years, there have been uh, a UTC program established. And by September 2017, there will actually be 57 UTCs across the country. Norwich, we're high up the sort of tree, so we're in the sort of second wave of UTCs. So we're one of 13 UTCs that will open this September, and we're specifically here to address the skills gap in terms of advanced engineering and in terms of energy skills. Okay, and th those are areas that are very important for the local economy, of course. They're very important for the local economy, and to get, it's quite difficult these days, get £10 million off the government, but to get your £10 million off the government, then actually you have to have the employers knock on the minister's door to say we have a shortage in this area, this is what it is, this is why it is. So UTCs respond to that local demand and the employers need to show that there is indeed that local demand. Now I know um, employers are a, a vital part of the UTC, they're not sort of an additional add-on, they're sort of fundamental to it. I mean, talk me through who you've got on board and what they'll bring to what the students experience here. Well firstly, I think it's important to say that the, what is now the governing body um, are all employers. And so it's crucial that those decisions be made at the highest level by people who are actually employers, not people who are, who are thinking or assuming how employers might act, but they are actually employers. So um, we have Yvonne Mason of um, Safe STS and Future Marine. We have John Morse of Guardline Geosciences. We have um, Ian Mayer of KLM Engineering. We have Scott McMillan of um, CLS Offshore. Uh, Sean Taylor. Um, of ST Racing um, representing that and um, of course we also have Richard Hill of Lotus ah, yeah. so those are the employers we also have representation from Dick Palmer of the 10 group um, for, for which we are part and also Ben Milner from UEA because that's where the U the university in um, UTC comes from. Ah right okay and um, th the employers will have a role working directly with students and sort of setting challenges I believe yeah, absolutely. So first of all, the board of directors, um, the, the governing body are employers and clearly they liaise with me about very much inputting in terms of the curriculum, the structure of the day, all those things so they can influence that and so we make sure that's right. A key part of our curriculum, we have a number of strands of curriculum. We have an academic side, which is very important. We have a technical side. We also have something we call technical challenges. And what happens is employers, such as those companies and others, will come in and they'll pitch to students a challenge. Uh, that may be of some technical nature, so they say here's, I often use an example of Lotus, here's a steering component, so what I want you to do, students, is go away and redesign, re-engineer this component to improve lap time. Students will go away, work on it with some guidance, working under the tutelage of the teachers, then Lotus will come back a month later and say, right guys, this is how it works. This is great, you've done a brilliant job, have a free car. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, they will say, you know, they'll give some feedback. Yep. But at the same time as they come back, they'll talk about the career opportunities. They'll talk about how many people they took on last year, they'll talk about salaries, career path skills they're looking for. Now that's one half term. Next half term, let's say we have KLM Engineering do the same, talk about opportunities in aviation. After two years, students can have a really, really good idea of the opportunities that are available here in Norfolk for young people, what skills they need, and also, let's hope that some of those young people are going to be inspired. Mm. People come in here and talk about an interest in cars, bicycles, skateboards, yeah. and that's very natural because that's what they're used to. But actually, the difference between a skateboard and a wind turbine isn't quite as much as you might imagine right. because there's quite fundamental engineering principles behind both. So it's really trying to inspire people and help them to find, what, to find their niche and turn what is an interest for them into actually a real meaningful career. Yeah. Um, now, is it right you have 219 students, you think, starting? We have 219 students who are all registered and we're expecting to attend, yes. Excellent. 
What, what sort of background do they come from? What sort of interest do they have? What, where geographically do they come from? Well, the thing is, they come from everywhere, literally. Yep. Um, in Norfolk and beyond, we've got people from Cromer, we've got people from um, Ely, we've got people from Lowestoft, we've got people from all over. And I think the thing is that they're all united in their real passion and interest in these areas. Um, the interesting thing is that they, we believe across the board of 54 high schools in Norfolk, we believe we've got students from 50. Wow. So it really is a really diverse appeal. You'll typically find one or two people from literally everywhere. Yep. And what we haven't found is that we haven't got like 20 from somewhere. It literally is a couple here or there. And that's also not just in the state sector, but across independent sector as well. Ah. We've got really students from all, all backgrounds, all ability levels, just that one common thing of being really, really passionate and interested about all things engineering. Fantastic. Now, I know you mentioned the skills gap yes. uh, a bit earlier. Um, tell us a bit about how, what the skills gap is and, and how this you know, really will make a difference. Well, I, I think the thing is, when talking to employees, they're looking for a particular combination of skills. And, and I think, therefore, to the sort of person in the street, they may not quite realise what those skills are. They tend to be a mixture of quite academic skills and understanding at a fundamental level of maths and physics, for instance, okay. and also being able to apply it to the real-world problem. Now, a lot of the education in Britain at the moment is actually very good on the academic side, or very good at a more very practical vocational side, but actually we're bringing a bit of a blend. Mm. And we're giving people that academic side, so typically our post 16 students are doing science, a couple of science A levels, say maths and physics or something, plus they're doing level three BTEC engineering. As, so far as I'm aware, certainly within Norwich, we're the only provider who does that. Um, and we're giving them the practical side, we're also giving them the academic side. So that's a bit of a unique thing, but it's actually what employers are saying to us, mm. particularly the employers we're working with, because that is a really good ground to go on to things like level four apprenticeships. So post-18, these are sort of going on to degree level type apprenticeships. That's the sort of really skilled stuff that people want to have. And indeed, of course, a number of our students will, will go on and work with UEA to go on to degree level as well. Okay. I think finally, I know um, there's always been an issue of uh, people want to get more girls into engineering. Um, I mean, I've seen plenty of girls have, have come here. What do you think about girls in engineering and, and how to address that? Well, we've learned a lot from that. And I think it's been really interesting because people have offered me lots of advice and they said, what you need is to get some pink dot martins, you need some furry spanners <laughs> uh, and that sort of stuff. But actually, talking to the girls, they want exactly the same as the boys. Yep. They're interested in meaningful, interesting, well-paid jobs, opportunities for travel. And why wouldn't they be? So I, I think actually sometimes that sort of message, we've got to make it sort of special for the girls, is not really what I'm finding. They want the facts. They want to know what the opportunities are, how they can access those opportunities. And if they're given all that information, and let's face it, you know, we always struggle with people who are very um, sort of coy about salaries. Mm. But actually for young people, they need to know those facts. Some people are going to be thinking, do I go to university and think of the cost that involves? Or do I go to employment? And if we can give them some of the facts, what the train will be, what the numbers are, will put them in a really good position to make a well-informed decision about their future. And I think actually girls in many cases are very meticulous about their planning and particularly want to have all those sort of dots crossed, dots ticked and whatever. So I, I think the thing is, with girls, as I say, they want what boys want. Um, and equally, I think a lot of the boys will come in wanting to save the whale yep. as much as wanting to think, well, I've heard there's a lot of money in engineering. Sure. Excellent. Well, thanks very much for your time. Really appreciate it. And um, good luck with the future. Thank you, Martin.